Perfect. Now, as as he's in Capernaum uh, for for quite some time, it, it says verse thirty one. He was in Capernaum and he taught them on the Sabbath days. So it's it's for weeks, and he once again keeps going to the synagogue on the Sabbath to teach them, and probably other days of the week as well. So now comes the time he's been baptized. He's overcome those major temptations. He's declared his his. Uh, messiahship in his hometown, he's relocated, he's begun to heal people uh, in the synagogue, he heals uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law in the end of this chapter 4, and now it's time to call disciples. So in Luke's account, I love his version of the calling of Peter, James, and John, and Andrew because he gives you a lot more detail than you get in Mark and Matthew's account. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Just another, another phrase one. for the Sea of Galilee. By the way, the Sea of Galilee, it's a fresh water, so it really is a very large lake. So you can picture this setting. You can picture, if, if you look at the shoreline of, of Capernaum today, visualize a, a large group of people coming out of the, this town down to the seashore, and they're pressing upon Jesus – now this is not drawn to scale – but picture him being surrounded by this big group of people, and he, he's standing on the shoreline, and there are all these, these people wanting to hear him teach. Verse 2 says, And he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and were washing their nets. So here off to the side, you can picture two fishing boats off to the side, and the fishermen are washing their nets on this uh, seashore. And he essentially just gets into one of the boats. Think about his sensitivity to the people. Have you ever been in a large crowd where they're all bunched up against one person who's, who's trying to teach, only the first few rows of people are able to really interact with that individual and, and hear them well. So if Jesus gets in a boat and casts out a little bit from the land, sets down the anchor, now he can see everybody, and water has this nice uh, acoustic feature that your voice will carry very well. Now everybody can see him, he can look into their eyes, and they can all hear him. So it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful setting to remember your audience and to speak to them in a way that's going to best connect. And Jesus is the master teacher, and, and so he's doing that in, in Simon Peter's boat. And notice he says that he, he prayed Simon that he would thrust out a little from the land, and then he sat down and he taught the people out of the ship. So you can picture Simon sitting there listening as Jesus preaches this sermon, and when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Now, we learn as we, as we read Luke's account here telling this story that Simon, the brother of Andrew, are in this fishing business with John and James, the sons of Zebedee. So the sons of Jonas and the sons of Zebedee, they're, they're all in this together. We've got these two ships. He's in Simon's. Uh, we learned that they've been out all night. They're professional fishermen. This is their job. This is their livelihood. And they didn't catch a single fish the night before. And apparently, Galilean fish, the, these tilapia, they, the schools rise up to the surface to feed at night, and then during the day they go back down. Professional fishermen know this. They, they live on these boats and this is their livelihood. They know the fishing patterns, and they've been out all night when they should have been able to catch some fish with their nets, but they didn't catch a single one. So I love this moment on that ship, can you, can you picture in your mind's eye the gentle rocking of this little fishing boat with Jesus looking at Peter the professional fisherman saying, Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Basically, Peter, let's go fishing. 
Now, if you picture being uh, the, the proverbial devil on Peter's shoulder right here, it would not be hard to give Peter a very quick list of two dozen reasons why that would be about the dumbest thing uh, a professional fisherman would do at that time in the late morning. You, you've been up all night, you're tired, apparently the schools of fish over aren't over on this part of the sea because we didn't catch any last night when they would have been up. That There's no way any of those schools of fish are going to come up right now in mid-morning. We just finished cleaning our nets. We're kind of discouraged. We want to go home. I, I could give a million reasons. I'll add one more. We think we have pretty good evidence of where Peter's house is in Capernaum. And if you look here, it seems to be one of the most substantive size homes in the community. So he obviously has done well for himself as a fisherman. Now, from today's standards, probably not. So he clearly knows how to succeed in the business of fishing. And here's this man who's been at the synagogue preaching the words of Scripture, telling him it's time to go fishing again. So can you, can, can you picture Peter, his response? I think about people today like, hey, um, I actually, I know you wanted me to do something, Lord, but I can think of all the reasons why not to. And yet, what do we hear Simon Peter do? Uh, so, so let's take a few minutes with, with this verse 5, Peter's response, because this is ultimately you and me. This is our story. This is one of those decision critical points of life where the Lord comes with a call for you to launch out into the deep and do something that maybe doesn't make any sense, and now we have a decision to make, just like Peter does on this occasion. So let's let's see ourself, see our story as Peter now interacts with the Lord. And in Scripture, there's no, there's no marker to show us uh, pauses in speech, tone of voice usually isn't mentioned, rate, speed of speech, uh, facial expressions, usually it doesn't talk about hand gestures, occasionally it will, but not in this case. So all we're left with is words in English that have come to us from Greek that were spoken originally in Aramaic. That's all we get. Two thousand years ago. Two thousand years ago. So we're going to do the best we can with the English version we have today, with his words. Do you think that Peter said it this way? Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. I don't know about you, but I can't see that happening because I can see Peter, this or Simon, this professional fisherman looking at this carpenter's son from Nazareth and wanting him to change his mind. Now, in Luke's Gospel, he's already seen Jesus heal people in the synagogue and, and heal his mother-in-law. He knows there's some power here, but come on, this is my boat. The, I know my trade, right? So I can picture Peter looking at Jesus with body language and with exasperation in his voice and, and exhaustion, kind of this idea of, Master, we have, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. And then I can picture Peter pausing with a, with a good long pause with the hope that Jesus will respond saying, oh, really? I, I, sorry, I, I wasn't aware and I, and I don't know anything about fishing, so tell you what, Peter, you tell me sometime when the best time to go fishing is and, and I'll come join you. Almost as if that's what Peter's wanting him to say. And in your mind's eye, if that's how it's playing out, what would the look on the Savior's face be as he looks back at Peter, who's just given him a really good reason why he shouldn't launch out into the deep? I can picture a look of and what's your point, Peter? What are you going to do? Because I'm not rescinding the invitation or in some cases the command or the call. And I can picture this moment of resolve for Peter on that gently rocking boat in that Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago as he sees resolve possibly on the face of the Savior. I can picture that moment of a heart softening and then he says, 
Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. You'll notice he didn't say, nevertheless, it is a good idea, it makes perfect sense and I'm going to go let down the net. He says, at thy word, Jesus, I trust you. That's the only reason I'm launching out into the deep. On one occasion, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, mentioning this amazing apostolic call for Peter, said something along the lines of, Peter had no idea how deep Jesus was inviting him to launch, how deep that ministry was going to take Peter into things that Peter the fisherman had no idea about. And uh, so we launch out into the deep, but there's a difference. Last night when they didn't catch anything, they were doing their very best work as professional fishermen, but this morning, Jesus is on their boat. There's something different when the Lord Jesus Christ is involved in work that he commands you to do. They let out the net and it is instantly filled with this incredible catch of fish, so big that it says their net break. I remember years ago a beloved teacher of the scriptures pointed out that at this point in the ministry that Peter's been called into, he was capable of catching and yet the nets break. If you fast forward all the way to after Jesus is re resurrected, there's a similar story where Peter cast down his net at the word of God and it's a big massive haul and the net did not break. And this teacher said, might this be a symbol that Peter truly is now fully prepared to be a fisher of men and to not let any go. That's a beautiful insight. So here's Simon Peter and we have this, this huge catch of fish and he beckoned under their partners, James and John, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them and they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. So we have history's biggest catch probably on the Sea of Galilee and we're limping these two boats that are beginning to sink back to shore and when we come to shore, Simon Peter saw it and he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I, I'm not worthy of this. I, I, I don't know what's happening here but I'm not worthy of it. I'm a sinful man. And I love that moment when Jesus invites them with the phrase, fear not. It's not just fear not the work, fear not people, it could also be fear not your own sense of unworthiness, your own, your own feelings of inadequacy. Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Fascinating that you have these two boatloads of fish that they're not going to go to waste. The families, the, the fathers, and they, they have people who are going to be able to sell these fish to the uh, processing plant down in Magdala where they salt the fish and then ship them off to Rome. They are going to make a significant amount of money off of this, which is a nice little touch for these four men who are now going to embark with this itinerant preacher and follow him around and not be able to help their fathers in the fishing business, it's a nice touch that Jesus provides this, this safety net, so to speak, for the families at the outset of the ministry of these four apostles who become very critical, critically important in the story as it unfolds. Now, many of you at this point are thinking, Wow, that's a, that's a delightful story about a disciple's ship, uh, and it is, but more importantly, it's a delightful story about discipleship. It's a story about your discipleship and my discipleship and our willingness to drop everything at the feet of the Savior and to follow him. D did you see the, the reality? that Jesus didn't come to Peter, James, John, and Andrew at the beginning of the, of the day 
early in the morning before teaching the crowd, when they have spent all night out on the ship catching nothing, they're probably discouraged. They're probably, their, their muscles are cramped, they're exhausted, they're ready to go home and say, that was a terrible night, let's go to sleep and, and try again tomorrow. That would be the perfect time to say, are, are you frustrated with your profession? Do you want me to give you something a little more exciting? No. He waited until their nets were full, and then he came to them because now there's going to be a sacrifice involved. There's going to be a price that they pay for their discipleship as they forsake their ships and their nets to follow Jesus. It's, it's going to cost them something, and it's going to mean more to them when they follow him and get to experience all these things that he has waiting for them in the ministry.